seriously. And uh, apologize because I was the last one here. So good job, everybody else tonight. Okay, we are on week two of this study. And it's about ethics. Today we're going to begin to build a foundation and a frame. And uh, at the very end of this, the actual process of ethics that we'll be using in the class. So with that, let me go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. Lord God, I thank you so much for bringing us here tonight, for again giving us the opportunity to grow in our understanding of how to live a life that pleases you, that honors you, that is glorifying to you, that is good, Lord, and that's, that's what we seek. So God, give us understanding tonight, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Um, so handouts next week will be emailed. This week they were printed, are being printed, and uh, if you need more, just you know, raise your hand later, but we should be able to get them for you. Um, that's if you like handouts. If you're like me, I, you know, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so I want to start off with, does anybody have questions about what we covered last week? Did you go home and stew and figure out how I'm wrong and want to bring it up right now? All of that is fine. Do you guys have any questions about last week? I love this class. You guys are great. Okay. And don't let like the other people stop you from asking questions. Ask questions and, um, and if you need to wait until the end, don't forget that you can always just come to me after the class is over and ask questions. Well, today we are going to build out this framework. And what I want to start out with is foundational truths. Okay. So we're going to kind of build somewhat of a pyramid theologically with ethics. And what we're talking about right here is this base layer. And what I want you guys to think of this as is it's the thing that makes everything else possible. What are the foundational truths that allow us to even come up with a framework for ethics? Okay? And that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna be today at the beginning. And I think I've got four of them. Yeah, I do. So I don't know why that number's back, but it's back. Okay? That's, that's the idea. So, so if you have like a, a visual picture, I want you to be on the bottom of this. And we are going to now fill the bottom of our pyramid with these four foundational truths. So it begins with scripture itself. Scriptures claims about itself. Whoops. About itself. That's where we're going to start tonight. It's the first foundational truth. We're seeing the Bible as the revelation of God. We believe that because of the person of Christ. Okay. When it comes to ethics, what claims does the Bible make about its ability to help us through ethical situations? All right. So the first text that we could look at is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which you guys should have in your handouts. And it says this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, right? We're familiar with that. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What does that passage tell us about scripture's claims with regard to ethics? What is the Bible capable of when it comes to ethical issues? Sorry? I'm asking the question. What, what claims does the Bible make about itself? Go ahead. It's our manual that we follow. It's our manual that we follow? So, so go back to 1 Timothy 3.16. Where are you seeing it as a, as a manual? What, what part of that says that for you? The first half, all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. That's what a manual does. Sure. Good. What else? What else do you see in this passage? Go ahead. To serve God, we will not be unequipped at all. Okay. So, sorry, you're saying that in the negative, basically, of that, that last verse? Am I hearing that right? Try, try to put that in that same, uh, like, pulling it out of your scripture. Okay. Good. Good. With the authority is God, please. Okay, uh, good. So let's, let's pull on that first. Authority, right? There is authority. Remember when we had last week the problem of doing ethics is that we can't have, the, everyone's going to an appeal to a certain authority, right? What makes scripture a reasonable 
thing to appeal to is who wrote it. God did. And because God wrote it, it is a reasonable appeal to authority. Okay? So we've got that. We've got, and I mean, they're all listed, I think, in your handout. Training for righteousness, right? So that's what it's claiming to be able to do, that it's, tra- it's able to train us for righteousness. Now, let me, let me ask you something. When, when you guys train, has anybody experienced training anyone to ride a bike, to sing a song, anything like that? Raise your hand if you've ever trained anyone. Do you expect perfection? No. What do you expect? Mistakes. Mistakes. Yeah. So I, I want us to understand that the Bible is not expecting perfection. It's expecting us to grow, right? That's why we're being trained in righteousness, equipped for every good work. It, it tells us that we can be prepared, be given the tools necessary to live in good works. Uh, if we're looking for ethical perfection, if everything we could do is good, we're there. And the Bible is claiming that it is able to equip us for that. It also uses those two words, may be. In the Greek, there is a whole case called the subjunctive case. And any verb can be made into a subjunctive verb. And what that means is not that this is going to happen, but that it might happen. So here's the other really important part about this. Scripture does not guarantee perfection. It doesn't even guarantee that you'll grow. It just makes it possible, okay? So the, the, the last piece that I want us to understand about Scripture's claims about itself is that it can make an ethically good, a morally right life possible, just possible, okay? Here's our second foundational truth. So again, building the bottom of the pyramid, this is everything else is going to flow from this. Everything is ethical. Everything is ethical. And there are two texts. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Even eating and drinking can be done for the glory of God. We've preached through that on Sunday morning, right? Why was Paul saying whatever you do, eat or drink? Because you could eat in a way that builds up your brother or drink in a way that builds up your brother or you could eat or drink in a way that tears them down, right? Colossians, Paul says something very similar except for he applies it to everything. He says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So the point that I'm trying to help you guys see is that everything in life is ethical. There's never an act, a thought, a word, a deed, a meal you eat that doesn't have an ethical component to it. If you ate a booger today, there is an ethical component to the eating of boogers. This is true. And it also tells us what good is. We're to do everything for the glory of God. And so now we've got an objective, a a place that we're trying to reach for. What is good? Well, what is good is the thing that brings glory to God, the thing that is done in the name of Jesus. Everything is ethical, and it's all to be done for the glory of God. We now have uh, an idea of what a good life might look like. Here's the next foundational truth. Coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. Whoops. Everything will be judged. Everything will be judged. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. One of. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. So all the different materials that can be used to build this work, their, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. 
It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. What do these verses tell us about ethics? Some big claims in here. What do these verses tell us about ethics? Yeah, there's consequences, yeah. And who's mediating out these consequences? Who's bringing them? God. God is the judge. God is the gift giver, the rewarder, and he's also the punisher. All of this comes back to God. So when you do something, anything, who gets to say whether it's right or wrong? Only God. Only God knows the answer to that question. So when you see that gangster in the street saying, only God can judge me, right? He's right. <laughs> Theologically true statement, right? Only God really can weigh the, the rightness or the wrongness of that action. We can all build, we can all do stuff, and we're building with wood, straw, and hay, gold, silver, precious stones, but God is the only one who can test and reveal the true nature of what we do. And... This isn't so much to scare us as it is to remind us that anything you do in this life that's truly good is eternally rewarded. So the scriptures claim to make us able to do ethics. The Bible tells us that everything is ethical. And then the Bible tells us that everything will be judged. And, and what you guys need to see is that they are, they are eternally judged. The implications of your booger eating today echo for all eternity, okay? Stakes are pretty high ethically for us. Any questions on that? Is it okay then to perform good deeds in this life with the motivation of being rewarded in heaven for eternity. What do you guys think? Hey, raise your hands if you think it's okay to do that. Sure. Yeah? Wait, raise your hands if you think it's not okay to do that. What, what makes it feel like it's someone who said it's okay? What makes it feel like it's okay? God's promises. God's promises? Okay. And what makes it feel like it's not okay? Motive. Motive? And what's wrong with that? Mo who said motive? What feels wrong about that motive? Only God can change the heart. Okay. Sorry? Self-serving? Self-serving. Self-serving. Okay. Your reward will be here on earth instead of in heaven. And your reward will be here on earth instead of in heaven. Okay. I want us to just turn real quick to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. I don't have my Bible, which is shameful. Would somebody read that out for us? Anyone. Who's there? So raise your hand if you're there. Would you read that out for us, Tim? Uh, 19 through 21? Yes. Okay, this is from the New Living Translation. Uh, Don't store treasures here on earth, where moths eat them, and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Beautiful. Store up treasure in heaven, right? And the follow-on line to that is, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So does Jesus want us to store up treasures in heaven? Yes, clearly, absolutely. How does one store up treasures in heaven? What's necessary for the heart for something I do right now to have eternal significance? For God's glory, yeah, what else? Motivated by love. Motivated by love, yes, absolutely. Oh, why? The, who wants to go to heaven? I'm just curious. Anybody, anyone? Okay, cool. Why? Why do you want to go to heaven? Heaven's a wonderful place. What else? Jesus is there. Hey, oh, there we go. He is my savior to whom I owe everything. 
Okay, okay, so your desire is to, is to be with Jesus. Believe it or not, guys, all the cool stuff about heaven, the gold, the rewards, all that, the, 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 the coolest thing about heaven is actually God himself. We're gonna be face to face. We're gonna enjoy him. So when he tells us to store up treasures in heaven, where your heart, where your heart is, right? The idea is that even now, the desire of my heart is to be with God. And so whatever that reward is that, that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, right, that we just read about, it, it has to do with uh, the desire of my heart, which is not just rewards unless the reward is God himself for all eternity. And so what many have said, and this very well may be true, is that the eternal reward of heaven is one's ability to enjoy God for all eternity. Does that make sense? So we could all be in heaven, and, and God will be infinitely good, don't get me wrong. But, but that the reward, if my, the joy of my life is God, and, and if the reward of heaven is himself, then perhaps the, the, the reward then is my ability to enjoy God for all eternity, right? If I told you you were just going to eat one flavor of latte for the you know, rest of your life, you would want that to be maximally good. You'd want to be able to enjoy that infinitely good. And if I told you that that latte is infinitely deep in its flavor, infinitely deep in the ability to enjoy it, it you would want to go deeper into that, right? We, we like TV shows and things like that because they make us feel good. Well, here now we have God himself whose joy surpasses all of that. And the reward then for, for an ethically good life is this ability to enjoy God more deeply, more supremely for eternity. Very well could be the case. I think you're right. If, if your goal for heaven is just to be rich in heaven, you probably won't have many riches when you get there unless your riches are to enjoy God forever. And then I would say that you'll be a billionaire, a trillionaire, a gajillionaire whatever it turns out to be, right? So something to think about. Yes, you should be motivated by reward, but the question is, what do I think reward is? Okay, does that make sense? Because if reward is God, then I, I want to be able to enjoy him maximally for eternity, and that should impact the way I live today. Questions? Won't our perspective also be different once we're there? Oh, because certainly. We take the crown or just yeah. Absolutely. But don't think that heaven is this equal experience for everybody. That's one of the other dangers that we have. Yes, heaven will be completely different. It will not be equal. There is reward for good and a, and a lack for not doing good. So it will be infinitely better than this, but don't think, well, it will be infinitely better than this, so I'm going to live a sinful life. It will not be an equal experience in heaven. Go ahead. Regardless of what you have. Yes. On earth in heaven, mm -hmm. you will be satisfied. Yes, absolutely. So if you have nothing, almost nothing, you're not going to envy the guy or person nope. that has everything. No, you won't. You won't. You won't envy him, but you won't have as much of as much as him. And that's the reality. He's going to have a better experience for all eternity than than you will. And at the, and you won't be mad because he's got a better experience than you will. But I do wonder if we'll kick ourselves in the foot for how we lived our lives on earth. As, so let's go back to 1 Corinthians. We have, an, we have to be careful. We have ideas about heaven. Let's go back to scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter, 14, uh, chapter 3, verse 14. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even, only, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So there's going to be a little smell of smoke. There's, there's going to be a little smoky in heaven. Yeah, and I don't... I, yes. To be a burn victim in heaven will be infinitely better, and you'll be a burn victim without sin, but it doesn't have to be that way. And the more we get our mind around that, the more we understand that we can impact eternity by our ethical decisions now. And if we don't think that way, we're just going to take it for granted that heaven's going to be awesome. No, no, no. Make heaven better. Where, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And you're... And you're your impetus for this doesn't have to be to enjoy heaven. Your impetus for this should be to enjoy Christ, to enjoy God. And that the more I enjoy him now, the more I will enjoy him then. That, that should be the 
the impetus for all of this. And if it weren't so, God would not motivate us unto good works by the promise of reward. And yet he so clearly does in scripture. He doesn't motivate us with idolatry, so the reward must be himself. But there is reward. This is really important, guys. Otherwise, we're going to get to the end of this, and you're not going to understand why you should live ethically. It's because it's internally significant. Okay, we're going to keep going. So everything will be judged. And here's the fourth very important aspect of our, uh, of our foundation. Sufficiency. And I'm just going to write sufficiency. Sufficiency. Uh, and in your handouts, there's the rest of it. Sufficiency in our salvation and the necessity of effort. And so we're going to go to another one of my favorite verses in Scripture, which is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, which read, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Just stop right there. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. So remember when we read that scripture is able to equip us, right? If there's any doubt about if, do I have enough in scripture? I know it's possible. Well, first Peter comes in and, and, and he says, or sorry, second Peter comes in and he, he says, everything you need for a godly life. So there is, there is no lack in your provision because God does not just give you scripture. Everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. The first thing that Peter mentions in the sufficiency of the gifts that God has given us is the knowledge of himself. And that is not knowing about God the way that you and I know about who's been actually in vacation in Hawaii. Okay, I'm not talking to you. I know about vacation in Hawaii. In theory, it's great, right? You guys who have been there, you know how good it can be, those white sandy beaches. I've, I've, only been, I've seen the white sandy beaches of Florida, and people tell me that, no, 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 Hawaii is, Hawaii is much, much better. So, okay, I'll take, you, I'll take you at your word for it, right? So uh, it, it's not that we know about God. It is that we have a personal relationship with God. His Holy Spirit now indwells you. You know him. That's the first gift. He's called us by his own glory and goodness. Now, when it says that he's called, he's certainly talking about calling unto salvation. So the, the second gift here is the gospel. It's salvation, right? And, he poured, and, then, and, and that leads to the next. Through these, right? Through, a, through the indwelling of the spirit, the personal knowledge of God, the, the gospel being saved, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the correction in this world caused by evil desires. So by knowing God, by having my life hidden in him, I have everything I need to live a life of godliness. I have everything I need to, to live a morally excellent life. And, and then this is what he says after that. For this very reason... Make every effort to add to your faith goodness. I want to make every effort. God's given you everything you need, so try 100% of your effort all of the time. <laughs> it's exhausting, right? Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, to self-control per perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, remember this is training, we're growing, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. This verse, by the way, if you're like, why don't I grow as a Christian? Just keep coming back here. Verse 9. Whoever does not have them, whoever's not growing, is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. It means they're not walking by faith in the gospel, right? And if you're walking every day by faith in the gospel, you will grow. 
And if you're walking by some other principle of life, if you've forgotten the gospel, you will not. That, that, I mean, just come back to this all of the time. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort, there it is again, to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we have two things here. We have the sufficiency in our salvation, in the gift of the gospel, the God himself, and all of those promises, we have everything we need for a godly life. And every ounce of your effort is also required. Now that's like not something that we think of when, when you say, I'm going to give you everything you need. You're thinking like, I'm moving from Louisville to um, Yakima. And Westside Church says, we're going to give you everything you need to move. So I'm like, well, of course, then you're going to have a shipping company come out and you guys are going to uh, have movers come out and they're going to move all my stuff and box it up for me. And then I'm going to come over here and you're going to have another company that's going to, and they're like, no, 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 we'll pay for a U-Haul. <laughs> and that's everything you need, right? Because you're going to put in the effort of boxing everything up and putting it in the U-Haul and bringing it in. And actually, I think the church would have done that. I just didn't ask the church to do that. That seemed lazy. Anyway, that's what God is saying here to you and to I, that everything we need for a, a life of godliness is here. And remember that that's significant because when we go look at the Old Testament, it's really hard for these people to live a godly life. They can't do it. They couldn't do it because what they needed was all of the gifts that come to us through the gospel, but now they've been given. So you are capable now of living a holy life, but it's going to require action. It's going to require effort. And lean on the promises. Bank on the promises. Depend on the promises. Your prayers should be filled with reminders to God of his promises that he's made to you. Lean on those things. He promises strength. He promises not to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He promises to make you wise and discerning. He promises to produce in you spiritual fruit. He promises to give you help and peace and joy and comfort. And you got to go back to God with all those promises and say, you said it. Don't dishonor your name, Lord, by forgetting or neglecting to give me the very thing that you've promised. You're a faithful God. Be faithful now. Pray that way to God. And don't forget your responsibility to grow. Make every effort. The good news is, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, that as you work, that might be 11 through 12, not 12 through 13, I apologize, that as you work, God works in you. Uh, so the way that I kind of explain this is, you know, if you put 100% of your effort in, it, it probably wouldn't be enough. But as you put 100% of your effort in, God is working and willing in you. And he takes that 100 and he makes it something much, much greater. Much, much greater. Right? O able to overcome temptations and all sorts of, of terrible things. Right? So that's the last piece, is sufficiency. Now let me add to that, at least up on the board, sufficiency and effort. These are four foundational principles for the structure that we are now going to build for Christian ethics. So you know, the, the Bible is filled with lots of verses. How did I decide that these four passages were foundational for Christian ethics? I just decided, okay, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not infallible. If you think of more you know, foundational elements of this, good. Incorporate them. This is not the end-all, be-all. These are just, as I survey scripture, when I think about foundational truths, these are, for me, what support what comes next. And if you have more than that, that's completely okay. If you're, if you're saying, hey, Joe, something's missing up there, you're probably right. Okay? It's all, it's all good. Questions? Not even one? We're all good with the foundationals? We're all good with what they mean? No questions? You guys are going to live perfect lives. Go ahead. I yeah. guess with the making every effort, it seems like the, the biggest thing for me, trying to make every effort is to deny the old human nature. It's a big part of it. Absolutely. Sure that, that is a controlling, that you do remember that you were bought with the price, that you have to have a new... Absolutely. Yeah, when we look at, I mean, what did Peter say? He said that if you're not growing, it's because you forgot. 
so much of make every effort is to walk daily in the new truth of the gospel. A lot of the effort's just remembering. A lot of the effort's just remembering. Remembering that the old man is dead and the new man has come. Yeah, amen. Amen. Okay, yes? Better. You might need to rephrase. Okay. Those that, gotcha. Well. <laughs> Sorry. And then I did want to say something too. Yeah. In the, in the context of remembering, mm -hmm. I think that is one thing that motivates me is the attitude of so much gratitude for what the Lord Jesus Christ did for yes. me, a helpless sinner. Yes. That motivates me then yep. to want to live right, to study His Word, to do things I don't want to do. Amen. Yeah, we're going to get to. Well, we'll see it here in a second, uh, actually with the next point. So now we're going to build the second level of our pyramid, and we're going to talk about the heart and why motives are so important when it comes to ethics. So we've made our back to the pyramid analogy, right? We built the foundation. Okay, now we're in this middle part. Now we're building, and if you were to think of like maybe a house, we've laid the foundation. This is the frame. Okay, this is the second uh, tier of our pyramid. At the top, we're going to have our functional model for ethics. We're getting there. But we have to start building a foundation first. So now this is the, the second layer of our cake. These are kind of more mm, actionable truths, as you'll see. The first is this. Ethics begins in the heart. Ethics begins in the heart. It's a inside out endeavor. It's why, you know, when we talked about like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do ethics in the Petri dish. That's like outside out. You're like, I'm gonna decide what's right out here and I'm gonna apply that to everybody else. Uh, as we're gonna see biblically, that's, that's not where ethics lives. Ethics starts here. It's again why the purpose of this class is to help you live a morally excellent life, um, not to, for us to go judge unbelievers about whether or not they abort their, their babies or believers about whether or not they get abortions because that happens too, guys, right? So we're going to talk about uh, inside-out ethics. Matthew 23, verses 23 through 28. Man, this, this is so important for ethics, so important. It's almost foundational, but it's not. It, it's built on, on what we had already. Jesus is speaking to the, the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Again, that's my proof text for graded absolutism. You can disagree with me if you like. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Why is Jesus so mad? Can anybody tell us why Jesus is so angry with these people? Injustice. Injustice, good. Not just injustice. What's the part of it that's really making him upset with, with, with the injustice? Hypocr hypocrisy, right? So you, you preach justice, but you rob the widow. That's what, you know, that's the aspect of the injustice that, that he's so upset about. You, you give a tenth, right, of your uh, mint, of your dill, of your cumin, of your spices, but you don't practice justice and mercy, faithfulness. You're blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law, you hypocrites. Verse 25, you clean the outside of the cup and dish. Here is one of the most important aspects of building an ethical framework. But inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. What does that mean? When Jesus says you clean the outside of the cup, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. What does that mean? Appearance. Yes. They're, they're, if outside, how do they look? Beautiful. Shining. They look like whitewashed tombs. That's what's going to come up in a little bit. Yeah, they look like Westsiders. Man, we look good. But inside, they are not like Westsiders, right? <laughs> inside, they're full of greed. Their motivation is off. It's about themselves. Self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, here's the ethical principle. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. 
Now, Jesus obviously is not talking about the dishes in your kitchen, right? Because you all know that that ain't true, right? Don't ever let me come to your house, invite me over for dinner and say, I learned how to wash dishes from Jesus. Please. If the outside of the cup is dirty, it's just dirty, right? What? We're not talking about cups. We're talking about humans. What's the implication of that statement? That if you clean the inside of the cup, the outside will be clean as well. What is the moral implication of that statement? What comes out. Okay. What comes out? If it's clean inside, what comes, what comes out will be clean. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And if what's inside is dirty, what's coming out will be dirty. Yeah, this is more of the, the fountain analogy than it is about putting anything in or outside of a, a clean cup. His point is that if you have a right heart, that you'll have a right action. And that is a bold ethical statement incredibly bold what what would make that contested in some of those views that we looked at last week so, yeah so what 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 um what what view of morality in particular is antithetical to this sorry I do good works, I, you know, all on the outside. Okay. But there's nothing inside. So there are there were models of morality that totally ignored the heart. That said the heart is completely irrelevant. The only thing that matters, yep. The only thing that matters is the act. Or sorry, not the act. The only thing that matters is the consequence, right? When we looked at utilitarianism, remember we looked at consequentialism? They don't, they don't care about the heart. Your heart has zero effect on the morality of a situation. The only ethical principle that matters is, did it lead to good or did it lead to harm? What Jesus is saying is that if the inside of the cup is clean, the outside will be clean as well, which means that as a Christian, you could make a choice because the inside of the cup is clean that leads to great harm for people on the outside for other people and that it could still be morally right. As Christians, we can make decisions where the inside of the cup is clean, the heart is right, and there are terrible consequences for other people and still be morally right. Can anyone give me an example? Preaching Christ in foreign countries. Closed countries and then your whole family gets slaughtered. There you go. Hey, Cass. I feel God, God's called me to go to Iran. Hey, Joe, let's talk about that. Why do you want to go to Iran? Well, because all the cool missionaries are going to Iran, right? Okay, we got a problem, right? Bad motives, right? No, 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 because uh, I, I have an incredible burden for the lost in Iran. I know that this could mean that we would die. I understand that, but I cannot not do this, right? God is calling me to this. I want to honor him. I want to obey him. And I feel like if I don't obey him, this, this will be sin for me not to go to Iran. And Cass says, well, we're coming with you. Because I, I am certain that God has called me to be your wife and that we're a family. And no matter what happens, we're, we're going we're gonna to follow this call. And then the family goes to Iran and we all get killed. Or let's say I survive, but my wife and my kids get killed. Have I sinned? Have I done something evil? No, I haven't, which is crazy, right? Because the world would say, yes, you have. You needlessly got your wife and children killed. And yet the other option of not going to Iran for that person who's been called would have been the sinful action. The action that preserved life would have been the sinful action. We are not consequentialists as Christians. We are not consequentialists as Christians. We don't bow down when the king of Babylon says bow down. 
We get thrown into furnaces. And sometimes we survive. And millions of Christians have been killed by the fires, by the flame. For good reasons, right? So it is so important that we understand the, the, the weight of Jesus' claim here that you clean the inside of the cup and the outside will be clean too. That if you make the right decision in your heart, that the act is good. That's an incredible statement, incredibly bold statement. Sillier example. Oh, sorry, go ahead, question in the back. Yeah, Joe, uh, expand on that more. That's, that's a good concept, but I'm just thinking, <clears throat> most of us aren't gonna go to Iran. No. But some of us are gonna have a family member or a family situation where if we speak out. Thank you. Exercise. Such a, such a good example. Such a good example. Let's say, so you've got, uh, I, had a, I had a buddy, um, a buddy at my last church who had a, a cousin that he grew up with, right? And, as, and they grew up in church and they were worshiping God together. And then one day the cousin walks away from it all. And like a year later, it, it all makes sense, right? The cousin was same, was same sex attracted, is same sex attracted. He's, he's attracted to men, right? And so uh, he knows that especially in the Korean church, man, there is not any room for this, and so you just have to go, right? Like, you can't be a struggling Christian who likes men. You, you can only just be a non-believer. There's, there's no other option. So he's like, okay, well, then I'm a non-believer. Walks away from Christianity, right? Invites Chani to the wedding. That's my buddy's name, Chani. Just got engaged, anyways. Um, and Chani comes up to me, he's like, Joe, what do I do? <laughs> do I go to the wedding? Is going to the wedding affirming this decision to get married? Or do we not go to the wedding? Because if I do that, I might burn this bridge. Now we're getting into consequences, right? Um, and, and lose the chance to speak out with the gospel, right? And what do we say as Christians? Don't worry about burning the bridge. That cannot be the reason. It's, it's, you can't control the consequences of this. Don't make decisions based on that. We'll get to later how that just plays into wisdom. And so there is some, like, think about the consequences of your actions is not a foolish concept. It just can't be the principle by which Christians make decisions. And so we kind of got to a place where it's like, what, what's your conscience telling you? What's God telling you to do prayerfully discern this? And I was like, you can't go and celebrate and let him think that you think that this is okay. You can't do that. But it doesn't mean you also can't go. And tell him you don't think this is okay, right? So it was one of those things where he's like, well, what do I do? And, it, and it, this is what they ended up doing. They ended up going to the wedding and being really clear. Like, we don't think that you're actually getting married because we don't think men can marry men. But we hope that you have a joyful life. We hope that you come back to church and give your life back to Jesus. And here's a wedding gift. That's what they did. That's where they landed. If they had said... We're just not going to go at all. It hurts our consciences to obey this. We're going to just send them a letter saying, you know, we love you. We always want to maintain a relationship with you, but we're, but we're not going to go. And that totally sank their relationship. It's still the right choice. As long as in their heart, they're trying to obey God. We're not trying to affect the outcome that we want to see happen. So tough as Christians, right? We want, to, we want to control the world. We want to be in the position that God is in. We have to clean the inside of the cup. So there was a lot of soul seeking and, and they felt in good conscience that they could go do this. And I've talked to other people who said in good conscience, they can't go to their own kids' weddings over this issue. And I get it. Like, you know, we're gonna, if the inside of the cup is clean, then go. And we'll talk about how to clean the inside of the cup probably next time. But really, really good question, Ed. Really good question, yeah. I'll give you another example. More normal. Well, part of it is not normal, but more normal the second half. So imagine that you got a husband here who's just done something bad. In this example, he's gambled away the family's savings. It didn't have to be that bad. Just something bad. Something he should not have done. He goes home and he cleans the house before his wife comes home. 
Is this a morally good or a morally evil act? Is God pleased or is God dishonored by him cleaning the house? What do you guys think? Thank you. It depends on why he cleaned the house. Because if, if his motive for cleaning the house is to make this wife coming home all angry about the savings being down at the casino now, if, if, his, if his goal is to alleviate the anger coming his way, who's he thinking about? Himself. Is it a morally evil act? Absolutely. God hates it. There's grace. Jesus can die for that, but it's evil. If this guy, whenever he feels remorse and repentance, tries to do good works, not to make himself righteous, not to take away his own guilt, but as a demonstration of his sorrow and his, his repentance, kind of like Zacchaeus, when he meets Jesus and he's like, I'm going to pay back everybody, right? That's not because he's trying to be righteous. It's a, it's a show of his repentance. If that's why he cleaned the house, then what? Is God pleased? Amen, he's pleased. There's a reward in heaven for all eternity for cleaning the house that day, right? And so there, when we come to morality, and I don't want to make, this is what I said is when we get into this and I start getting all squishy on morality, you guys are going to think that I'm, when I forgot what the other one was where you just, you're like, it depends on the situation, situational ethics. I'm not. But I am saying that if the inside of the cup is clean, the act will be good. And you can have the same act with a clean cup and a dirty cup. All right? It doesn't necessarily mean that the inside is dirty or clean. You can get the same act out of, out of both cups. Go ahead. It sounds like we're talking about character. <laughs> we are definitely talking about character. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, just as an example of this, Isaiah 29, 13, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules that they've been taught. You've been taught to go to church, to sit in that service, and to sing praises to God. But that worship of God might be merely based on human rules. Real worship is when the heart is the reason that the songs of praise go to God. That's real worship. And the, the opposite is, is not. Okay? When the, when the scriptures speak of the heart, we're going to use the word heart a lot. I'm going to just tell you this right now. We'll unpack this more later. Don't think of the heart as just the emotions, the seat of emotions. Often when the Bible says heart, it's referring to your mind, it's referring to your will, it's referring to your emotions, it's referring to every aspect of you that's not physical. That, that immaterial, I guess physical, but the, but the immaterial side of you, all of your thoughts, all of your emotions, all of your will is bound up in that word heart. And uh, I'll, I'll make the case for that at a later point. But when he says their hearts are far from me, don't think just emotions. That, that's also thoughts, that's also will, okay? It's, it's all of you. Bottom line, we have to have right hearts to perform right acts. Without right hearts, you can't perform right acts. So that's the first piece of the second aspect of our pyramid. I want to, remember, I want to remind you of two things. Although we're going to talk about the conscience a lot, the conscience is a tool. And it's a very sensitive one. And the dials can be turned on the conscience. Okay? So you have to keep your conscience in good working order because if it's not, it'll tell you that something's wrong that's actually okay, or it'll tell you that something's okay when it's actually wrong. What is one way where our consciences lead us into trouble all the time as Americans? How fast we drive. How fast we drive. Woo! I've heard so many theological reasons for why that's not a sin, and they all fail. I just want to be clear. When you speed home tonight, Jesus is dying for that. Uh, yeah, money. How about the way we use money? Jesus says, if you got two jackets, give one away. I bet all of you, like myself, own way more than two jackets. So remember that the conscience is a tool. Oftentimes, people will cite their conscience as a reason not to do something that actually they just don't want to do. <laughs> and their conscience isn't tuned, it's not dialed in properly, and they're not going to fix it. Like, I kind of like having a misdialed conscience. It gets me out of this situation that I don't like. 
Be very careful with the conscience. The second is that the heart is beyond searching out. So a big part of what we'll do next week is talk about how we can raise awareness of the heart. But I want you to know that there's a limit to that. You can't know the depths of your own heart. First Corinthians chapter four, verses one through five, Paul says, I don't even judge myself. Now my conscience is clean, right? He's examined himself. He's done his best. But he's like, I don't know the depths of my own heart. Only God knows that. Same thing with Proverbs. I think it's Psalm 16 two, maybe Proverbs 16 two. I think it's Psalms though. Um, of a, uh, David says, like God revealed to me my, my secret sin, right? He says, who can know? Who can know the depths of a man's heart? Who can know the, the sin in a man's heart? So just remember that like, I, I do want us to raise the awareness of our hearts, but that you'll never know your heart fully. So I want you to think about it for a second. What I just said was your job is to clean the inside of the cup and that you can never know whether or not the cup is actually clean or not. What does that do for us ethically? Yes. I'm, I, am, I am hopelessly now in this problem of ethics. Uh, you've just told me that the cup has to be clean, but I can't know if the cup is truly clean or not. And that makes me dependent on God and particularly on his grace. And it is that for that reason that we need a priest to mediate between us and God. Because you can bring God the best possible action that you've got, right? And the kind of the analogy that I use is like, like it's salsa. And how much vomit do you want in your salsa, right? How much? What's the acceptable amount of vomit in your salsa? Zero. Yeah, God feels the same way about your good deeds. The acceptable amount of sin in them is zero. But you can't get it all out. And that's why grace is so wonderful and why Jesus is so good, and why he makes your worship to God acceptable. Because he's there taking your offerings to God, and as that salsa comes up to him, he's pulling the vomit out, right? He's like, I'm covering that with my blood so that this can be a, a pleasing and acceptable sacrifice to you, Father, from Joe Lemkul, right? And that, that, I mean, praise the Lord. So God, we need God's help to, we're at 657. I need to hurry up. Okay, number two. Number two, we are seeking understanding. So this first point was, man, the, the inside of the cup's, the cup's got to be clean. The second piece of this is that we need understanding. So Solomon uh, is known for his wisdom in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. He goes to God and he says, God says, what do you want? And, and he says, I need wisdom so that uh, you, you, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and and wrong. So we have this whole world, and we've got scriptures, and the reason that they're able to make us is that we, we also need wisdom and discernment to be able to know whether or not the thing I'm looking at lines up with scripture in a morally right way or in a morally wrong way, right? So we need wisdom. First Kings chapter 4, verses 32 through 34. This is the next chapter, and he's making a point about Solomon's wisdom. He says, he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. Check this out. He spoke about plant life. From the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Saul's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. So he doesn't just have wisdom and understanding, he seeks knowledge. In fact, in the Psalms, he will say to his son, Study the ant. Study the ant. And you'll learn something about hard work, right? So there's wisdom and there's understanding and there's the seeking of knowledge. Go ahead, Irving. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, he was wise, but very unethical. <laughs> oh, yes. In his wisdom, and this is the limitation of, here's why the cup has to be clean. Because you can have a lot of wisdom and a sinful heart, right? And it just makes you really good at pursuing sin. Wisdom comes from God, true wisdom. I'm talking about spiritual wisdom, not worldly wisdom. Spiritual true wisdom comes from God and it leads to righteousness. Proverbs 2, 6 through 11. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield for those who walk in, whose walk is blameless. For he guards the court of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. 
Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path, for wisdom will enter your heart. Knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Wisdom comes from God. And in fact, he commands us to pursue it. Not an option. If you're a Christian, you must pursue wisdom. Proverbs 4, 4 through 9. Then he taught me and he said to me, take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Here it is. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. <laughs> That's what it says. I make it up. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. We need wisdom. If we're going to make ethical decisions, know the difference between right and wrong. We need wisdom. How do we get it? Well, it begins with the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It starts with fearing God. What does that mean? Anyone want to take a stab at that? What does it mean that, that wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord? Sorry? Don't want to answer? <laughs> Had a thought? Go on, somebody. Isaiah 6 is what comes to mind. Isaiah 6, okay, good, yeah. Wait, when he has to eat the scroll? Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Or is it the fire? Oh, oh. Says, woe is me when he has a right view oh. of God. Yeah, oh, good, good, yeah. So he's seeing God and he's like, woe to me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Sees God and he's just like, fear. Yep, go ahead. Some awesome reverence. Awesome reverence, good, yeah. I would say the fear of God also... Part of it is fear because you know he knows and you don't. So, yes. So if you and you're gonna bow to whatever yes. he says because you don't know. Yes, yes. All of all of this is absolutely true. It is to recognize that God is holy, he's just, he's all powerful, right? But it's one thing to know those things. When the Bible says in verse, Proverbs 1, 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What that means is to say that to the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that you take all of those truths and they become your worldview. They become the core, uh, they, they, they live in the very core of your beliefs, which means that as you look at the world, you see a world that is created by God and accountable to him. And then as soon as you have that, as soon as you have a world that is created by God and accountable to him, he's going to judge it. Now you can begin the journey of wisdom. See, we can observe a world and because God is consistent and he doesn't change, the world is consistent and it doesn't change. And we have worldly wise men who have basically just looked at the patterns and brought them out for other people to read and to understand. But the reason that that's different than the, like this wisdom, which comes from God, that has the fear of the Lord, is that they don't understand the underlying principle for why that is. And that is that God has created the world, that God keeps it up, and that God will have everyone give an account. So we have to have this worldview that has God at its center. And then, once you've got that, you can begin to gain wisdom. And you gain wisdom... By listening and seeking. I'll read some Proverbs. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of the fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. If you go read the Proverbs, circle every time you read the word listen. It is everywhere. You gain wisdom when you stop talking. I know I should stop. And you start listening. <laughs> Proverbs 15, 14. The discerning heart seeks knowledge. There's seeking involved. But the mouth of the fool feeds on folly. To gain wisdom, you, you must seek knowledge. You must seek wisdom. You must seek understanding. Uh, Proverbs 15, 12, the plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Uh, it's not a box that you check and say, I asked one person, so now I'm a wise man, right? Many <laughs> advisors. Look for lots of input. Proverbs 15, 32, those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the one who heeds correction gains understanding which means that you need to seek out people who will correct you. Let me tell you something, guys. 
If you don't have people in your life who are going to correct you, you're a fool. You're a fool. I want you to think about the people in your life. If you've got no one who will correct you, or if you know the people who will correct you and you avoid them, you're a fool. The wise man loves to find out that he's wrong. Loves it, right? Because if I, I, don't, I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to think improperly. I don't want to have bad ideas. I want to, I want to be right. I want to do what's right. If you don't feel that way, if you just want to feel right instead of be right, then, then you're a fool. You're a fool. Proverbs 18, 15, the heart of the discerning acquires knowledge for the ears of the wise seek it out. If you want knowledge, right? Uh, sorry, sorry. The wise person will acquire knowledge. So, so one of the things that we have to be careful of as Christians is doing bad research or allowing somebody else to do the research, right? You're going to acquire knowledge if you're a wise person anyway. You're going you're gonna to seek to gain lots of information. You're going to acquire it. You're going to do your research. And then finally, James 1, 5 through 7, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives it generally to all, uh, generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by, that wind. by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Above all, we need to pray and pray with right motives to God to give us wisdom and he will give it. There's lots to say. Here are the closing thoughts. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It comes by seeking and listening. Good seeking and good listening will include people who will disagree with you and correct you. If you don't have that in your wisdom seeking, you don't have wisdom. You don't have, you don't have good knowledge. It doesn't mean that you'll agree with them, right? So, I mean, you should listen to people who think you're wrong. That doesn't mean that they're going to be right, but it's really important to hear what they have to say. Personal pursuit of knowledge. That's another part of good seeking and good listening. Not just waiting for facts to be fed to you, but going out and acquiring, seeking knowledge. A willingness to learn from unexpected places. Remember the ant. Learn lessons from your kids. All of those things that you think are beneath you, learn lessons from them. And lastly, view correction as a good thing. Not a bad thing. I want to be corrected. I, I want to actually be sure that, that what I know is what I know. I, you should love it when people poke holes in your thinking. It's part of being a wise person, someone who seeks understanding. Questions? More of a comment. Yeah. I guess that would be that why it's so important on who you choose to get that advice from. So important. Yeah. Look at, look at who the person is. Look at what they have to say. Look at what other people have to say about that person. People you agree with and people you don't agree with. Yeah, I, this is so, so important, guys. Um, I think a, a lot of times as Christians, uh, you know, so I, I remember my dad, and he's not this way anymore, but at one point he said to me, I don't, um, I don't really go back and double check John MacArthur. You know, I've checked him enough times and it's, it's been right. And I trust that his judgment is so sound that I, I just kind of accept what he has to say. And my dad's being really honest, but what he's doing is what a lot of us do, right? Hopefully, I've scared you enough in this class so that you don't do that with me. Don't just trust what I have to say wholesale ever, anybody, right? Like always judge what we're listening to. But if you're looking for advice, if you're looking for counsel, go to someone that you believe is wise. Just don't accept everything that they have to say. The last part, last piece of our middle portion of our, of our pyramid is living in worship. And this one's a little more straightforward. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. One of the principles that we started with, the bottom pyramid of, of the bottom of the period was that everything is ethical. Everything is ethical. I'm supposed to do everything for the glory of God. 
the outworking of that concept that everything is ethical is, is Romans 12, 1. It's worship. I live my life as a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. I live my life to bring glory and honor to him. And when I do that, when I become this person who lives sacrificially in worship to God, I have brought everything in life into that sphere of morally good, of ethically right. I become a living sacrifice. And, and so much of that is obedience to the will of God, which is why he immediately ties it to the will of God, right? Verse two, then you'll be able to test and to prove what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. God didn't write a Bible that's going to have what you should do exactly in every situation in life. And so what Romans 12, 2 tells us is that we have to have some sort of an ethical framework in order to do what God wants me to do as I drive home. Because there's no Bible verse about whether or not I can go 40 or 45 or 35 on some of you, right? So I need to find out what is God's pleasing and perfect will. And Romans 12, 1, you're going to see in what's ahead is, is really providing for us a system for us to use ethically. So uh, I'm going to close tonight with the final, the, the top of our pyramid, and we'll pick up with that. Uh, next class, but you'll see some overlap here. This is going to be the framework. This is going to be the steps that we'll use to think about ethical things in this class. Number one, examine your heart and context. It is what's going on on the inside of my cup and how does that relate to the external factors in my life, right? So uh, you go home and your kids are making a bunch of noise and it's been a very, very long day. And if you hear one more kid scream, you're gonna, ah! You're like, stop, be quiet. Everyone's getting spankings, right? What, what, what's going on here? It's not just about what's inside the cup. It's also how it relates to the, the context outside. We're going to raise that level of awareness. It's the first part of our ethical system. It's where we'll pick up tomorrow. Number two, you got to study the scriptures. Two and three are that part about seeking and gaining wisdom. So these three, they connect with those three that we just looked at in the middle tier of our pyramid. Study the scriptures. If I'm going to gain wisdom, if I'm going to understand what God's will is, I got to go to the place where he revealed his will right, which is the scriptures. So I'm going to study scriptures and, you know, based on the ethical issue, study the relevant scriptures, okay? And then here's this next part, study the issue, right? Not only am I going to gain wisdom, I am also going to study the issue. I am also going to gain understanding, knowledge. I want to know about the topic I'm going to make an ethical decision about, and then the last part is test and approve. Test and approve. And that's what we just read in, um, in Romans, that we test and approve. Um, part of testing is acting. So what's interesting is that as we make ethical decisions, we don't stop at act. Act leads into uh, more reflection, which is approving, okay? Okay. And so we'll see that play out a lot more uh, next week. But this is going to be our this is going to be our framework. And so what what makes Christian ethics unique is that this examining of the heart and the context. Uh, what we'll get into is talking about renewing of the heart and making sure that the motives of my heart are good, that I want to please and honor God and do everything for His glory. That's the first step in ethics, right? And then we can start studying the scriptures and studying the issue. I can gain wisdom and understanding for the right reasons, or I can gain wisdom and understanding for the wrong reasons, right? So we've got to start with the heart. I'm, I want to do this for the right reasons, and then I'm going to act, and I'm going to judge my action, and I'm going to get advice, and I'm going to grow, right? Remember that this whole process is not for you to be perfect tomorrow. 
it's for you to grow. So you're going to grow in your ability to discern, grow in your ability to test, grow in your ability to approve God's pleasing and perfect will. Go ahead. The simple thing of buying something could lead to a whole series. Buying something from China. Yes. It's cheap. <laughs> yeah. But some people know that they have some sweat factories in China, and people are getting paid almost nothing to make what we buy. But it's, and we've all got one. Uh, everywhere you go, yeah. it's made in China. Yeah. And it's hard to get away from buying something. Yeah. I think it's crazy that this this marker, I'm going to use it tonight, and we're going to throw it away, and then it's going to live for another 500 years in the landfill. <laughs> That's so wild. That when you whatever, yeah, uh, yes, on and on and on and on go the ethical implications of what we do. That's why we got to be good examiners of our heart. You know, what's my motive for using this marker? I got to study the scriptures and study the issue. I really got to think about it before I go and act and then finally test and approve what God's will is. And if I think it's okay, you know, before the Lord to use this marker, I should. But, but here's the thing. If I don't, if I go through all that and I'm like, you know what? I, I have a problem with using this single use plastic that's going to last for 500 years. Then don't. And, don't, and I hope what happens as you go through this is that you get an understanding for why other people make the decisions they make. You don't hate them for it because you begin to understand that, man, they can do that for the glory of God. And even if you don't agree, amen to that, right? Go ahead. I can help you with that. Okay. <laughs> Everything is biodegradable. Given enough time? Given enough time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this whole universe is going to biodegrade given enough time. Lord God, come back soon, right? Okay, it's 716. Thank you guys for sticking around. Let me pray for us and we'll end tonight. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, all that you've given us tonight. God, I pray that you would take these scriptures, Lord, and anything that was good and true tonight, I pray that you would plant it firmly in our hearts. Lord, anything that I said that was wrong, just help us all to forget it and um, to come back next week, Lord, and begin to unpack the actual process of making decisions. God, help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. I'll stick around for about 30 minutes. If you have any questions, come on over.